the idea of working with different sources of inspiration has always appealed to me. And so the idea of working with sound as a different kind of um, input was really quite appealing to me. Never thought about sound and using it visually. So when this all textiles uh, call came up, I was thinking, oh, it could be really interesting, you know? And it has actually changed my whole work in practice. I've been involved in the project, I think, three years from the beginning. Um, yeah, and everyone's sort of like, oh my God, that's what it's about. And like, yeah, I think there's there's a really nice kind of narrative and story around it and people that really draws people in because it is something different and I really like that. So I first got involved in the Oral Textiles project via Lynn. Um, she let me know about her idea and her and George had had this concept of encouraging and inspiring design in a really modern way using sounds that have been recorded in the local environment. I am a hand weaver based in Aberdeen City and in 2017 went to a workshop up at the Glasgow School of Arts Highlands and Islands campus in just outside Forest on circular economy in the textile industry. So it was thinking about um, taking what's considered waste stream from textile manufacturing and thinking about ways that makers might be able to work with it. And it was while I was there that uh, one of George's colleagues introduced the two of us. I was doing some research work for the Glasgow School of Art uh, out on the islands. I took out my sound recorder and began to just uh, just record the sounds of the birds, particularly on the Macher. And when looking at the spectrograms of these bird songs, you end up seeing the actual sound pattern of, of that bird song. A spectrogram is basically a type of audio visualization that looks at the entire frequencies of, of an audio clip and displays those in their kind of respective space and time format. And it was in that point where I thought, oh, I wonder if these patterns could be recreated in either knitting or weaving. Take that visualization, clean it up, focus in, find a unique pattern. Make a sound that is nostalgic or emotional um, to take something and to be able to effectively immortalize it. So to have that object that's there as a permanent reminder of a transient moment in time, um, but also to have it as a, as a talking point. So as soon as we started talking about it, it was one of those instant, yes, of course, that makes perfect sense and absolutely we can do that. When I first started with the knitted samples, it really was just a case of taking the spectrogram pixelating it and then translating that directly stitch by stitch to a knitted pattern. But when it came to taking it onto the loom, it was much less about trying to recreate the shape in the fabric and more about using the shape to direct how the loom was set up. And we demonstrated that you could do it with knitted fabrics. We'd also demonstrated that you could there was design potential for woven fabrics. So actually what happened if we took it into other textile disciplines, but also if you gave it to different knitters and different weavers. So Lynn and I decided to apply to a grant of the Royal Society of Edinburgh um, to see if we could gather a group of practitioners from around Scotland and introduce them to this sound to textile pattern making process and see what came of it. What we really wanted to do was to make it as simple and as open sourced as possible so that anybody could take that sound of anything that they wanted from bird song to machine sounds to sounds of people and voices and use it as uh, the data for their work. I think for me, it was the fact that they were looking for textile makers and not having worked with textile makers before, I found that a really interesting proposition. I was really interested in um, how the sound of place can kind of connect you deeper to where you are. And so it made sense, this project, um, to have a look at 
yeah, to have a look at the sounds of the landscape and incorporate that into work. The oral textiles project began then with our six practitioners. Two of them were weavers, two of them were knitters, and two of them were screen printers. We had given them uh, different approaches to working with the sounds, but basically shared with them that sound to pattern process. Yeah, that first phase was great, just sort of forming that we we unit of six of us and yeah, sharing ideas and different processes and practices and learning about other people's what other people were doing, yeah, within their own practice was really, really great. The first stages of working on the project were really about tuning in to sound more and appreciating that part of my environment more which I hadn't really paid very much attention to at all and realising what are the sounds that I hear all the time and just screen out. When we had done our initial explorations, just George and I together, it was very much about the spectrograms and the data when we'd presented it to those first group of six textile practitioners. Again, it was very kind of spectrogram data focused and they did work with them throughout that phase of the project. But by the end of it, there was, um, you know, part of the, the learning that came out of that was that actually some of them were much more interested in having a more intuitive response to the sound rather than that um, taking that kind of visualization step in the middle. Prior to this project, I had a studio and I guess my uh, creative practice was focusing on screen printing joined the project, it was great because it gave my work a bit of focus. I think it really introduced me to working within a, a project team and just, yeah, made me really realise that I really like to kind of bounce ideas off other people. On this beautiful macha is where I spend most of my time getting my inspiration for my small uh, weaving uh, business practice, creative practice. We were to partner up and share our practice collaboratively. And Beth and I, I think we just really loved our um, approach to painting and an approach to, um, you know, our love of abstract art. We decided that I'd go to visit her in Uist. Um So I spent a week there and yeah, actually, the weather was very wet and windy, so I had picked rain as a theme um, for me and was able to get these amazing recordings of, like, the wind and rain battering against the windows and the chimney and everything in her house. Yeah, that gave me some good sounds as, as a starting point. And then I think we also did a bit of vis visual exploration of that. So I think um, this is a drawing which, yeah, I guess is uh, in inspired by a spectrogram of one of those sounds for, of the wind and rain bashing off the house. But then I got quite interested in bringing in a squeegee and, and, and replicating those kind of, um, I guess, visual symbols that were coming through from the spectrograms. Initially, the sounds that we gathered were uploaded and created spectrograms, and this is how we got the patterning from it. But as Beth and I really enjoy exploring abstract expressionist themes, it just seemed a natural development to then go from the look of sound electronically, digitally, to then kind of embracing that idea of acting that through emotional response to sound. And then for me, the marum grass is an extension of that. So then I started doing these like little mini sculptures up here. During that week, she took me down to the local beach and took a bunch of photographs, took loads of photographs all week. Um, but I guess a couple of the, the images that really resonated with me, these were patterns in the sand um, of the different kind of colors of, of grains of sand. So then the kind of process to get them made up as screens for screen printing was to put them into Illustrator, do an image trace, and then you get this kind of pretty heavy black and white version, which then, so you can use that to, to develop a screen. So I guess that was what had developed as my kind of vis visual representation of, of wind and rain. 
So when Beth was in North Uist last September, in September 2020, we just really brainstormed and we decided that we would make the work about the Macha. The Macha is a very unique ecosystem. It's under threat and I really think it needs to be publicized. The birds that I have recorded, the skylark, the corn bunting, the corn crake, all of these really seriously threatened species need to be highlighted. And so my work is conceptual and it's really about trying to show the threat of, of modern life and climate change and modern farming techniques how it's really affecting and impacting the natural world. And I was looking at the ancient art of weaving. We wanted to incorporate all the natural materials. So I've got marum grass in there, pocketed in some of the weaving. Then I've got my kind of my wool. I've got hemp and I've got linen. And these are all plant-based fibers. And I'm just trying to look at ways of echoing that this is land and it's natural. But also we decided on a panel each, a hanging panel. I wanted to leave lots of areas of the warp exposed, trying to make it look as sort of rudimentary as possible um, and to, to make it look really, really, really rustic because that is a, is a sort of metaphor for the way that our natural world is being destroyed and my printed sound is actually the male skylark ascending. So when a skylark sings, what he does is he leaps up from the floor and as he's ascending, he starts singing. She had done these lovely drawings um, which were inspired by her sculptures she'd made of the marron grass from the maca um, and then basically she pinned these to her um, wall hanging so that I knew where the placement of them so it was really just a case of um, kind of unrolling her um, woven piece and then gradually going through the process of printing each section and then Beth would have her panel is quite heavily printed because it was so windy and rainy Basically, it was a, I used the table here and it was a case of um, pinning a section of the, um, the wall hanging down and, and deciding, really making decisions about where I wanted um, the printed sections to be, um, working out whether I wanted to use the screen or then create something that was smaller or larger or a variation, cutting out the stencils and then pinning everything down, printing it, drying it. The maca is so fragile and so threatened. And even if we have all these conservation um, projects that are going on to try and protect it, it's, it's still not enough because of climate change. So I do feel almost like some kind of a, I feel like a custodian. I'm very drawn to water. I'm very drawn to water and to the places where the land and water meet. So Dundee is perfect for that. Um, and I'm really interested in shapes that are made along a coastline or a river. And I'm interested in the fact that when we come along as humans and you know we we change that boundary and we impose grids on something that is not normally a grid. It's not normally straight lines, but we put our straight lines there. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of weaving in itself in that I'm taking flexible thread and I'm imposing a grid on it and I'm pushing it into its place, but the thread pushes back and it's that tension between the structure of the cloth and what the thread wants to do that makes woven cloth so fascinating.
to me. I love Jen's work and the graphic shapes that she uses um, and the very clear lines in her work. And I felt there's, there's a, a resonance in the, the things that we are both drawn to design-wise, but also we're both really quite geeky about processes and really interested in how designs become tangible objects and what you can do with different materials. Well, we started with a very strong idea about our end goal. Um, we wanted to bring together our di very different materials. Jen works with brass and I work with thread. We wanted to put them together and make an object that had both elements in it. Um, and what combined metal and textile for us was the idea of a suit of armor, uh, something wearable, uh, a breastplate, chain mail, something like that, that we could create that would incorporate these two elements. And we had the idea of weaving the brass into the fabric. We felt that we needed to shape the brass for incorporating into the textile but actually the shape that we designed turned out to be even better if you didn't incorporate it into the textile if the brass became the textile itself we've thought a lot in this project about protection um, it's been a theme obviously that's been on everybody's minds for the last year or so and so we've taken as our our sound we've we've taken the sound of hand washing um, and we got other members of the oral textiles team to wash their hands for us and record the sound so that we could explore those patterns in our designs. We're working more with the sound wave patterns than with the spectrograms themselves. Um, the sounds of hand washing don't make particularly interesting spectrograms. Um, but they do make interesting wave patterns. And depending on whether somebody washes their hands very briskly or is slower and more methodical, um, you get a different shape coming through in the wave, which is something, again, that plays out very well in both Jen's brass designs and in the woven cloth. We decided to create this protective wardrobe um, that a sort of a, a priestess of safety might wear to perform her ritual hand washing or whatever it is that she needs to do. Um, and so the, the chain mail made out of brass and yarn is one aspect of that. And I'm making a, a simple garment, a sort of um, tunic style dress that will have these... Um, echoes of the brass designs woven in silk in the fabric. So they're not, they're not a whole outfit, but pieces that you would select from the wardrobe, depending on the occasion. It was really exciting when the different disciplines joined the project. I mean, it was wonderful to work with all textile makers. That was very exciting in its own way. But then to bring in these other crafts as well, it just turned it up a notch. After the kind of success of that initial um, experiment, Lynn and I and the six practitioners decided that we would try for a bit more money and see if we could actually develop this idea further. And rather than just exploring it through textiles, we would explore it through a variety of arts and design um, engagements and collaborations. So we managed to get these six new practitioners, ceramicists, uh, silversmith, furniture designers, all to come in and work with our six textile designers and makers and create what's called now the Distributed Capabilities Project. Distributed Capabilities is about encouraging uh, hybrid ways of working and making. It's about um, opening up conversations between different uh, design and arts disciplines. So we wanted to make sure that it wasn't 
information and knowledge that George and I controlled, but actually it was something that could be sent out into the world and shared widely by anyone who wanted to use it. So that was what took us to the idea of having one of our original six textile practitioners paired up with somebody new. And actually then the responsibility for sharing the process fell to one of the new, one of the original six textile practitioners. So they were then explaining the process to their new partner. I'd known Lynn uh, before the, the invitation to join the Oral Textiles Project and I knew that she was doing some really interesting work using sound and developing patterns from sound. I just thought it was really exciting. I'd never heard about that before. I'd never thought about something like that. I saw it advertised and I was really intrigued to be able to work and um, get to know other craft practitioners in the field. We were asked to meet up in Huntley and we had this kind of speed dating um, it was almost like a speed dating setup. There was different exercises that George and Lynn did with us where we had to introduce ourselves and but you had a, like a minute to do it to each of the makers and the idea was that by the end of that weekend we'd all have kind of developed a collaborative pair or have an idea of who we'd like to work with. And we knew that when we set up this uh, cross-disciplinary element to the project that um, and we wanted it to be one of the original textile practitioners with one of somebody new who was from a different making discipline. Some of them paired up quite quickly. Some of them paired up with more than one person um, and carried that through to the, the very end of the project. To see your sound as a visual, was it just opened up so many possibilities and working with other people that were um, you know, like-minded in the fact that, well, Beth, my partner in <laughs> this project, um, she we, we made a connection with the surface pattern that we both loved. Beth um, uses screen printing and I was using um, screen printed enamels for my ceramics. And so there was lots of overlap in our techniques and our approaches. I have developed my own studio practice using predominantly slip cast process. So I make my own moulds and I use liquid clay and the mould and I um, cast geometric forms which I then decorate with surface decals. So I use enamel transfers based on um, the graphics of every day. So I might be inspired by the inside of an envelope or a barcode or something that I find on a piece of graphics and I use that on the surface of my forms. The first time you came to the studio you showed me how to screen print using paper stencils yeah. and I showed you my practice and then became, it just kind of naturally clicked that we think all right so we can do what you do on a tile yeah. and then and then we thought, well, one of those puzzles would be quite interesting. Then we realised we had 11 or well, nine other people that we could get inspiration from. Yeah. And it just all fell into place. The final piece is going to be a, um, a tile puzzle made of 11 tiles. Each tile will have uh, a motif generated mm -hmm. from a sound from each participant on the project. I can't remember who had the no, idea, but it was a bit like... Oh. Yeah. It was like a light bulb moment when one of us did and I think it was, I guess it's just an extension of that mm -hmm. collaboration. Mm -hmm. It's a way of involving everybody in the project into our mm -hmm. kind of final piece. Yeah. Um, I think the sounds have been interesting. Um, mm -hmm. They've been mainly um, relating to people's practices. So mine is the noise of the squeegee. It's very much just a noise that I associate with that moment before you lift the screen and then you see your result, which is the magical part about screen printing. My sound was the kiln clicking on for the temperature and we, you know going up and up. So when you hear the click, you go, that's fine, it's working. So you know that that's, it's, it's on, it's, it's ramping up, as they say. Um, Nettie sent us a cracker this yeah. week, which is um, her industrial sewing machine, <laughs> which is like a drill. <laughs> um, but it's sort of like an intermittent noise as well. Right. And then you've got some really gentle sounds. Mm. So some people have really kind of, um, kind of shown as sums up what their practice is or their environment. So people, yeah. you know, like Dwynman lives in such mm -hmm. a beautiful place and she's captured that with the, the bird and the same for Marie. Yeah. So my part of the um, collaboration is I'm manipulating the sounds on Audacity and then putting the motifs onto the tiles. Experimenting with the Audacity, that became quite natural to me then. So yeah. you passed me the sounds that we'd collected from the other participants. I manipulated them on Audacity um, and then passing them back to you, Beth, so that you were then able to use your skills and expertise on Illustrator. This is one of the ones I've picked out for Callie. Um, so my process in Illustrator is to bring that into 
um, the application and do an image trace of it. So that's the actual um, image and then that's a couple of different variations which have been image traced with diff slightly different settings. And then what I'm doing is I'm zooming right in and picking out like an area of interest mm -hmm. and then taking that from there. So I've taken that one and that one and then blowing them up. So enlarging them. And then what we've been doing, um, so it's, it's really nice because Laura's starting the process, I'm working in the middle and then I've been providing her two options and then she's choosing the preferred one. Um, and then I'm creating that into like a, a 15 centimetre tile motif, um, which is the size of tiles we're going to be working yep. with. The idea of the tile puzzle, well, it will sit in a wooden frame. There'll be a space so that you can move the tiles around. Mm -hmm. So actually the initial idea when we thought we were going to be able to hold an in-person exhibition was that um, folks visiting the exhibition could interact with it and mm -hmm. actually create their own image mm -hmm. by um, moving the, the, the tiles, tiles around. around. Obviously, if we had people to come and contribute yeah. and to interact with it, that would be really exciting to see what sound these people would, you know, what the visitors would create. And I think that's the kind of missing part of the puzzle. So I'm going to mm -hmm. create a printed version of it. So basically by making paper stencils, which um, are the same as the, 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 the uh, transfers. Yeah, as the enamel transfers that Laura will be cutting out mm -hmm. to, to put onto the tiles. And so I'll use those paper stencils to make a, um, a screen printed version. So like a printed panel that will, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. stand yeah. alongside, mm -hmm. be hung alongside the tile mm -hmm. puzzle in the exhibition. That's really cool, that one. Yeah, it's like figures. Yeah. But, but yeah, they're all from the same sound, which I think is really interesting. running a ceramics practice for quite a long time now and I used to run a very uh, commercial tile business but really over the last while I've been much more interested in making work that is installation based or sculptural or is dealing with a very specific subject. The focus of my business is to produce hand dyed yarn for people who enjoy hand knitting and to also create designs for people who enjoy hand knitting. The dyes that I create for that yarn are not only natural dyes, but they're sustainable natural dyes. They are made using materials that are gathered from the material around me uh, without harming this beautiful environment, but also reusing waste materials from other local businesses. I'm trying to reduce uh, waste and work in the most sustainable way possible and one of the kind of really interesting kind of reasons why I wanted to desire to be paired with someone who worked in ceramics is because I think we share a lot in terms of the approach to our art being really tactile. Um, ceramic artists are constantly looking for things that create kind of touches and um, sensory experiences. Dwayne Wynn and I met and quite immediately connected on some, some of the subject matter that we'd both been working on. So some of my earlier ceramic pieces um, deal with memory and dementia. Professionally, I had previously worked with people um, and their families who we're living with dementia. Music can be particularly useful and therapeutic and so can be helpful in comforting people um, and drawing out interaction with them even when they lose the ability to, to speak or remember certain people and activities and, and places. So together we quite quickly decided we wanted to explore um, visually where things are lost, so memories um, or senses. We found a, a common thread for the piece of work that we were doing in terms of incorporating the sounds of community in our work. So the sound that we particularly connected to was the sound of music 
um, particularly more traditional Kaylee music, as something that is so deeply sort of in your in your memory um, that even when your other senses and your other memories are, are are missing, you can often connect to sound in a way that that you might not other things. So we use that as our starting point. Working with the idea of the Kaylee steps, uh, the first thing I do is create accurate representations in charts and knitted samples that precisely represented the steps of a Kaylee dance. So for example, twists and turns would be represented by cable crossing stitches. Promenading forth and back would be represented by columns of stitches. And the first samples were unbroken, accurate representations so that you could follow the dance almost as instructions if you were to follow a tactile set of instructions. So in our exhibition, we'll have some beautiful hats that she's knitted that actually have dance patterns around them. Um, just a beautiful sort of sense of taking something which is quite difficult, but then transforming it into something really beautiful and something wearable as well, something comforting that keeps your head warm. To incorporate the experience uh, of a person living with dementia into the knitted Kaylee pieces, what I did was cut the pieces um, and then they could unravel and be pulled apart to represent the, the gaps that appear in somebody's memory uh, when they're experiencing dementia. Um, I also made some new pieces and dropped stitches, so deliberately missed a stitch during a row and the stitch begins to unravel. And that represents the experience somebody has of grasping for a memory. The other thing I did was make some pieces which then had um, stitches grouped together to make a bobble or a big lump in the piece um, and then carry on. And that represents an experience of dementia where somebody can be fine for a long period of time and then they have a dementia event that's very specific, that is disruptive, and then their life can carry on again. And so after creating these pieces, what I did was pass them on to Carol, who went through a process of exploring and pressing them into clay. So these are some of the sample pieces that I created just to sort of get a sense of, of what that knitting can produce. And I particularly liked the, the black glaze because I thought that really emphasised the beautiful shapes in the knitting without it being obviously knitting. What that does is represent the experience of living with dementia and the way that affects the people who are loving and caring for those people that it's not just an experience that is held within one individual, it is pressing and impacting on the lives of people around them, their friends and, and their family. Um, and that's shown through the, the impacts and the dips and whirls that are in Carol's pieces. So the pieces I then developed, I've got sort of two quite different um, pieces. These pieces in black have the knitting sort of wrapped around them. You can see I've, I've also sort of carved into it to increase that sense of, of uh, holes and things that are missing, um, but also creating it into a bowl shape because a bowl is a container. So it's, it's that sort of sense of containing a memory as well as uh, something being lost a little bit around the edges. This white piece um, is unglazed porcelain. It's very thin. And it comes from a, a shawl that Dwynwen knitted. And I've created this piece with a very gentle curve as a sort of a sense of something that's sort of wrapping around you and quite comforting. And yet it still has these lovely areas where it represents the drop stitches and the bits that are missing. Um, and the translucency of the porcelain is lovely, but also enhancing that sense of things that are fragile and, and breaking away. Obviously, we've been a bit restricted in the exhibition because of, of 
of COVID and the things that we, we can't really have an exhibition that people will touch. It's interesting having had that element in the middle, an ongoing element even of like the pandemic part where then everybody had it kind of forced upon them, <laughs> even if they were living down the road from each other. It's still then that different perspective, oh, hang on, we've got to carry on this conversation and develop something, but you mean we can't go to each other's studios? I think we were really lucky that we had met up in person way back um, at the start of the project. And it's always been the meeting in person which has pushed this project forward, um, which has been interesting um, to learn. Because I think when you're trying to meet up on Zoom, it's all very well when you're in the moment, but as soon as you come off the computer, it's hard to get things done um, because life takes over and other other jobs get in the way. Um, so it's been tricky, I think, um, doing a long distance collaboration. I think partly because our starting point was so rooted in the materials that we actually found it quite difficult to not have our hands on each other's work. Um, that was a really important driver for us. And without that, it's been quite difficult um, to keep the momentum going. On some level, it's sort of been unfortunate, but then on another level, it's just required all of us just to uh, step up and like answer the phone and be available when questions come up because we can't be in the same room together. In a way, I, I think it's, it's made us quite clear and direct and, you know, to be able to articulate and be really clear about what each of us individually want to contribute and can contribute to the project. So maybe in some ways it's made it easier. I think actually this kind of remote way of working is opening up a, a whole um, chance for people to, to get to know each other more. And so converting my artistic practice to and collaborating to online just seemed like a very natural um, way of working. I'm somebody who kind of believes in collaboration so much that I've been facilitating it for other people. Um, but Oral Textiles was a chance for me to become a collaborator. Uh, so I got a bit greedy and collaborated with two people. So when um, we started the project, we were all kind of introducing ourselves to one another and we were asked to take a piece of work. So this was the piece of work I, I took with me. And I said to people, I would really like to, I'm obsessed with circles. I use them all the time in my work. They kind of symbolize everything and nothing. And I, I really like that kind of aspect of them, but I'd quite like to use other shapes. So that was the kind of challenge I set. So when Olive and I started working together, we were looking for other shapes and playing. And we've, with our collaboration, we've looked at lots of possibilities. And what we realised was, was that every time we got together, even on the phone, in person, we spent a lot of time laughing. And so it just occurred to us, laughter was actually the really interesting common thread. And actually, particularly working through lockdown, it was such a a bit of a godsend really to have Olive to, to laugh with you know when we were all kind of up against it and thinking you know this is a crazy world so laughter was really important so we recorded laughter and then we used the um, audacity to investigate the pattern and lo and behold when you look at it in that level of magnification you uncover a series of lines and circles and we were back at circles. And in addition to that, when I had gone to visit Olive when we first started ch chatting about what we would do, she introduced me to her punch card patterns that she uses for her knitting. So these um, sample pieces that she knitted for me are actually based on a random set of circles. I took this pattern from the original ceramic and then she knitted it. So we couldn't get away from circles. We just couldn't get away from them. So the piece that we're making is a series of circles. The ceramic element um, is, is the circle piece that I'm making. And then Olive is creating these uh, hanging buttons and she's wrapping them in textile. Um, it's a technique that a lot of textile artists use to, to sample colors and see how they look together. And the inspiration for that really is, again, another version of the spectrogram and a particular way of looking at the, at the sound. You get lots of lines which come in 
variations of sh shades of blues and pinks and so that's the kind of inspiration for these stripy effects if you like um but again it's just it's really playing to olive's command of the color spectrum when uh when we were all together olive had introduced everybody to the idea of the punch card and had asked them all to to make the sounds that they were working with into punch cards for her to knit up samples. So she knitted little samples like this for everyone. And we've used these knitted samples as the basis of the designs that we're working on. Some of them we've enlarged, some of them we've abstracted, some of them we have taken quite literally. But of course, each time we kind of interpret and iterate them, we get a slightly different version. I've been involved in furniture making for 25 years. I'm really interested in different craft techniques and incorporating them into my work. Uh, I'm specifically quite interested in chair design and construction specifically because I really love the scale and the immediacy of the objects and how people engage with them. And I also, um, seating provides a really fantastic vehicle for looking at um, and incorporating lots of different um, elements from design and structure and ergonomics and practicality and form and function and then you know and then the um, sort of the proof is in the pudding when people sit in them yeah. and you can tell because the body doesn't lie. I had met Olive previously um, at some uh, craft fairs and um, and I just really I loved what she did is like her the whole element of pattern and how she incorporates pattern and color into the text the energy textiles that she produces. Olive had spent um a reasonable amount of time developing an idea when I stepped in um and joined with her to work on the collaborative process and so the sound that was picked was the sound of Olive using her knitting machine we took the conical shapes of those frequencies and we developed those into three dimensions. And the the way that we decided to do that was to uh, develop spiral constructions and then um, integrate the weave process, which Olive you know, does um, into the spirals. Um, I use Rhino as a um, computer program to generate the drawings and then um, just import them into the uh, CNC computer. You work out the cutting and the drilling sequences, and then um, put a sheet of plywood onto the bed of the CNC, and then it cuts uh, sequentially. I really love the directionality and the movement contained within the spiral, so I was quite keen to do that. And this is like a very simple one that was just cut on the bandsaw. These were very formative, I don't know, experiments. Um, we were looking at different ways to incorporate the textiles into them. So we explored this one. This is like a double spiral here, which I thought was really fascinating. This one's wrapped as opposed to woven. So we sort of decided that actually what we would do is that we would have this quite um, fairly transparent, um, but I think uh, once it's wrapped in its uh, entirety, that there'll be some really lovely patterns that occur between looking through the object. Every discipline thinks in a different way which was something that was so nice doing this project. I think that there's a huge amount of value in seeing how other people, how other artists work and approach their work. And it sort of opens your eyes to different possibilities. So conceptually, not, you know, conceptually and practically. I think collaboration is really powerful and, and particularly over this last time, you know, while we've all been in lockdown, it's just brilliant to have connections with other people and to help that kind of stimulate ideas when you might be feeling a bit unsure. I think it's the way ahead for the arts. I think that people need to work more together. I think that people need to be more open 
and I think it's the way ahead for all creative industries, that they inform one another, they inspire one another. I've lived in Ness for about 15 years and I'm a kilt maker. So I moved up here to train as a kilt maker. Um, and then I specialised in using Harris Tweed, making contemporary Harris Tweed kilts. And I know when I first met Ola, she had a huge beaming smile and was just really, really bubbly. And I just thought you just got really lovely energy and just chatty and easy going. Um, so I knew I liked her as a person. I mean, they're all great people as people um, and all amazing designers and makers. Um, but I think it was just when talking to her and then seeing images of her work, I just thought that's completely different to mine. I'm currently based in Calendar and I work between landscape painting and textile design. So I come from a screen printing background um, and I studied textiles, printed textiles and embroidery at Edinburgh College of Art. Nettie had already started a, a project which was looking at mapping and um, the shipping forecasts and she'd be doing this before oral textiles. Um, so she wanted to push that kind of theme forward. All are actually just kind of, well, I can just come up, just come up for a weekend. Yeah, and then when we arrived, it was 40 mile an hour winds, and we're like, right, well, that's all we're going to hear. So that's <laughs> all we're going to record. So that's what we did. It was fab because it was a gale. So it meant from the shipping forecast point of view, I got data that I knew would kind of do something. If you listen to the forecast, there's the speed, the wind speed and the direction and then the sea state and all of that. When I do the, the plotting of it, I take the wind speed and the direction and I basically draw the lines in the direction from the wind is blowing and I have like a, a ratio of doing that. So say it's gale force nine blowing from the north, then it will be a line going down nine centimetres. And then when it changes direction, it will then go that direction for the length and the speed of the wind. Hence why if it's a gale that's on the shipping forecast, it's good because it's higher numbers, so it goes longer. The thing that I love most about making garments is the pattern cutting. I love that puzzle of working through the shapes and then putting it into 3D form. So when I look at it, I start to go, oh, okay, that could be a, an armhole and that can be a sleeve and that can be this. And, but if you've just got one mirrored line, in pattern cutting, when you're working, you're always working in halves. So it was literally like, right, well, if I then mirror that, that becomes then another shape. And then what I do when I'm looking at that, kind of going, right, well, how can that become a garment? Using folding techniques, taking a big piece of fabric and folding it again. Um, and that's where the kilt making side comes in. When you make kilts, there's a lot of folding techniques and kind of pressing and you're working again with a huge length of fabric and pushing it all together. So the shape of the garments were dictated also by the shipping forecast. We use the same pattern for each garment. So they're the same structure and um, with the two different textile concepts. So there's the big linen piece at the back, which is basically to represent that big piece of cloth with a, a slit and a cut and go, look, if you fold this, then it can become one of these two things. There's the one that's got all of the sample pieces. When Ola was experimenting, she sent me lots and lots of sample pieces of um, her screen prints and interpretations and mark making and all of those things, which originally we were gonna kind of select from for the final piece, but actually coming to make it, I was like, rather than waste these samples, or not waste them, but rather than have these kind of archived and put into a sketchbook, why don't we use them physically within a garment and we'd go from there. So I literally did that. I kind of balanced them out into that folding technique that I said about, added more surplus material, I guess is the best way to describe it, that I had in the workshop that went with it. Sample pieces that Ola had made, they worked from a practical point of view. They worked from a zero waste point of view and they also worked from a design perspective because it was like it was all all tied in. And then they were stitched together and created into one big piece. The other one I made up out of calico from the studio um, and then sent it to Ola basically and she then put her screen print onto it. Um, we've used um, screen printing and not necessarily like painting in the traditional sense but painting directly onto the fabric. So a big part of our project was looking at um, how to reduce waste. So we've used a bit of screen printing, but the hand painting onto fabric answered that quite nicely because it uses a lot less ink and you can water it down to make it go further. One garment um, looks at kind of more emotional response to sound and um, the textiles do it anyway. So we took the sound recordings and then I drew in response to them and also had a look at the spectrogram visuals that, they, that these sounds created and drew. 
from from that visual as well. Um, so one garment is a fusion of those kind of mark makings. So it's all quite expressive and a bit wild because um, we were recording Sounds of the Winds, um, which were pretty crazy that day. The soothing sound of hearing the shipping forecast in that voice and that tone is what drew me to it in the first place. Of listening to it once I moved up here and it, understanding the significance of it more so. Um, and then having had the experience of actually recording the sound of what that forecast is predicting. It was pushing myself creatively, I think, and um, working with Nettie's um, kind of concept, because I wouldn't have come up with something like I did had I just been left to my own way of working. It was an absolute delight to see all of the individual pieces that were created. With such a wide um, kind of set of craft disciplines as well, you know, there was a really wide range of, of objects that were created. It wasn't like you were just looking at ceramics or you were just looking at textiles. To have all of those different craft disciplines on display at the same time. But with that core element of the, the sound that, that underpinned it, Working with sound in itself has been interesting. It's opened up lots of new ideas, but also the collaborative process has given me more confidence, I think, in, you know, in going into collaborations um, that we can find common ground um, and you know, create something completely new that has the mark of both makers on it. I think it's opened up a whole new world, I think, in terms of yeah, I guess inspiration and starting points for projects. The opportunity to like meet a lot of different creative people and, and work alongside them and together with them collaboratively has just been amazing. One thing I would say about my creative praxis going forward is sound. Sound is going to be equally important, if not more important than the actual visual part of it because I think that you know it's just a really sort of profound way of of seeing because we don't really listen to the world around us we never stop even just the the sounds that were selected the things that were important to them that they wanted to work with some of the concepts that came from those discussions as well the, you know the some of the pieces were really conceptually driven um, and others were much more about the, the process of collaborating. Everything that we've been sharing with our practitioners, we have applied ourselves. I'm incredibly uh, proud of that collaboration and, and want to hopefully keep on working together um, in the future as, as we develop our own practices as artists, as researchers, as designers, and as people in general.